My name is David Spencer. Uh, I lead the PCERT engineering function within Dell Technologies, and I want to thank you for taking some time out of your day today to listen in uh, this presentation about how we within Dell's PCERT group handle root cause analysis. Uh, just a little bit of background about myself. I won't spend much time here. Uh, I've been in this role leading the PCERT engineering team for about two and a half years, and prior to that, I was doing software development uh, for a variety of product teams within Dell and EMC. Um, most of those uh, product development roles had some amount of security uh, embedded in them. Uh, and then I made the jump over to the product security organization within the last uh, few years. So I don't think I need to explain to people that are attending this conference how important root cause analysis is in a secure development life cycle. Uh, it's built into all the frameworks that we follow, whether it's SSDF or ISO 27001, even FIRST's own PCERT maturity model, all require the use of root cause analysis to learn from the incidents that happen to our products and applications. But I will just spend a moment on this slide just to refresh for everybody uh, why it's so important. So obviously, uh, when you're developing software in a secure way, you do have various security controls that you're hoping that your development teams are utilizing when they write their software. You have security education programs, which you're hoping they will attend and learn from. And then you're hoping that those security things take hold. And when the product teams do their development and testing, they're doing it in a secure fashion. But no matter what happens, you know there's always going to be vulnerabilities that somehow escape this process. And if you can learn from those vulnerabilities and take those learnings back in to your security controls, back into your security education, back into how the teams are doing their development and testing, hopefully that process improves your stance overall. And so every vulnerability that escapes your development environment is a chance to learn something about something that went wrong and prevent that specific thing from happening again, maybe prevent things like it from happening again to other product teams throughout your company. So before we dig into how we are approaching root cause analysis currently, I think it's important just to give a little bit of background of how the security stakeholders work within Dell Technologies. This model is certainly not unique and I've vastly simplified it for this slide, but of course we have a product security organization here in the middle and that product security organization has a number of teams in it. The two that I've shown here are the ones that are of interest to this conversation. We have a team that's responsible for our secure development lifecycle, which we term SDL. <clears throat> and we have a team that's responsible for vulnerability response. Specifically, uh, we'll be talking about PCERT, product security incident response teams. So these two teams handle all the security incidents in a centralized fashion, right? All the security practices and incidents within the product security organization. But within a company like Dell, there are hundreds of different product and application teams scattered throughout many different business units in the company, each of which having people of varying skill when it comes to security and varying uh, expertise and knowledge about security practices. And so we have a program like many of you do, where we have security champions embedded in those teams. And the security champions are developers or testers or product managers or all of the above who have some level of security expertise and are considered in their team, the subject matter experts on security. And they are the ones who interact most closely with us, whether it's during development, when they are looking through the SDL practices that they're supposed to be enforcing on their teams, or whether it's during the vulnerability response cycle, when they are helping make sure that the process is handled properly and that the issues are remediated properly. So that's sort of the picture, just as a background, uh, the, the conversation that we're gonna have assumes that, that that is in place. So when we look at root cause analysis in a company like Dell, uh, the immediate concern you have is around scalability. Um, every, every, you know, root cause analysis was always a part of our secure development life cycle, whether it was done in a centralized fashion or in a distributed fashion, it was always there. But over the last few years, we decided to take a look at it and try to make a process which was going to be driven through our PCERT organization to formalize it a little bit. And we'll talk throughout this presentation about why that is and how we did it. 
But when you try to do that, you immediately run into a, a little bit of a scalability issue. You have the vulnerabilities that are coming into our organization discovered by, in many cases, external finders outside the company, whether it's researchers or customers or folks that are signing up for a bug bounty program. You've got hundreds of different products and applications, all of them in varying stages of maturity in their security journey. And you have a PCERT team, which is lean. <laughs> and sometimes maybe you might uh, talk to some of the engineers, they might tell you that they're a little oversubscribed, that the work, they were already busy before we decided that we wanted to, to sort of centralize this root cause analysis procedure. So given that scenario, we have a lot of interesting questions to ask about how are we going to approach the problem of root cause analysis? What sort of quality information do we want to get about this? Uh, certainly one approach to root cause analysis would be to say, let's pick uh, a, a small number of very interesting security issues and dive deep into them, sit down with the product teams and dig into it. Another one might be to say, let's get a little bit of information about every single issue we have. Um, there's, there's trade-offs on both approaches. You wanna be able to come up with a solution that we can automate and fits into our existing automation capabilities so that as the product problem scales, our solution scales. And we sort of have to make decisions about what types of work we're gonna prioritize when it comes to root cause analysis. So we had a lot of questions to ask. And in the end, we decided to focus on kind of the primary question about root cause analysis, which is answering, what happened? What was it that happened in this situation that led to us um, needing to have the, this vulnerability? Oh, sorry. So some of the things that could have happened, there could have been gaps in how the SDL procedures applied across the company. Uh, we call that a gap in the SDL coverage. Uh, different organizations are at different levels of maturity and gaps in how those, uh, those procedures are applied to those organizations might have led to an issue. There could be a, a situation where the SDL procedures didn't focus on a particular issue or that the team didn't focus on a particular SDL procedure. It could be that there was uh, an error, uh, quite common, right, where a, a team is trying to do the right thing but falls short. Um, there's this interesting scenario here, which is uh, a team might have acknowledged that there was a risk here, didn't think that it was going to actually result in a vulnerability, but it did result in a vulnerability. And then there's this last scenario, which would be a truly novel vulnerability, something new that has happened that we were totally unprepared for, and uh, this is a chance to learn from that. So with that in mind, that was our initial focus. These, you know, we want to be able to take every issue and sort of categorize it into one of these buckets. The question became, how do we approach the problem in a way that lets us answer those questions for the highest number of vulnerabilities possible? And so that sort of drove us to focus more on the quantity side of the equation, as opposed to doing a deep analysis on the quality side of the equation. What that gives us a chance to do is to turn our scalability problem into a solution, into a feature. So instead of being a problem, it now becomes a selling point to say, we have a lot of data uh, coming out of this root cause analysis because we've decided specifically to gather it about so many issues. So with that approach, we really faced some early struggles and I wanted to document some of them here for you. And every single one of these bullet points could be a, a hallway conversation or a whole slide on its own but I would just wanna run through them and give you a chance to see a little bit into how, how this decision to do root cause analysis in this way led to, led to some interesting conversations. So the first one that I wanna call out is messaging. Uh, you use the word root cause analysis and people who have engineering backgrounds immediately think of a bunch of engineers huddled in a room with the door closed for a few days until they come back with a specific recommendation of exactly what procedure needs to change so that this never happens again. And while that's certainly appropriate for some types of root cause analysis, we were deliberately not targeting that type of situation here. And so one of the things we did was start modifying the vocabulary when we talked about this. We sort of drew this picture for people of multiple levels of root cause analysis where at you know, the very top level is this level zero that gives you enough information to, do, to, to make some changes without needing to do that deep dive that we're talking about. And once we started using that messaging, it started becoming a little more clear what problem we were trying to solve. 
Another problem that we faced at, specifically at Dell had to do with our asset categorization. So uh, when we started talking to different stakeholders, it became immediately clear that there was different groups that cared about different types of assets when it came to doing root cause analysis. So our initial focus uh, as engineers was proprietary code. We want to know what, you know, here's a chance where you guys were writing code and, and something went wrong and we want to help you fix it. But it turns out that a lot of our application teams are doing some level of customization of off the shelf applications. And there's just as many opportunities for things to go wrong there. And those teams really wanna learn from, from the vulnerabilities that they face as well. And so figuring out how to make that mixture and how to uh, prioritize those issues is pretty important to us. Another problem we ran into once we started to scale this up was in normalizing the outcomes that come out of it. So the initial impression to sort of get this process off the ground quickly was to sort of do this in a, in a free form way and let the engineers provide as much data as they wanted to. But it became pretty important early on to sort of force people to put their answers into very specific buckets. It was the only way we could deal with the scale that was going to come up. Uh, one example of that would be we made a decision to sort of map uh, every vulnerability, as we already did for, for normal procedures, into a CWE. And then once you have that CWE, we can do some further automation and mapping based on that. So take the CWE and map that to the specific security control that should have, in theory, prevented that common weakness enumeration, that, that error. Uh, so if you say this particular vulnerability could have been prevented by these three different security practices and could have been tested for with this specific type of security testing, that gives us a great place to start in having a deeper conversation with that product team. Even if we don't know for sure that that particular vulnerability could have been prevented by, in that specific instance, that specific SDL control. Another challenge that we had to face early on was building a starting point. Uh, you take a procedure like this and describe it and people can start to understand what you're talking about, but it doesn't give you data on day one. This is a, a process that's going to take some time to build up over time and is interested in sort of historical trends and large scale, um, you know, what, what you're seeing on a larger scale. And it's a little harder to sell that to somebody and explain that you're starting this up and that they might see some interesting data in three months. So what we had to do was sort of go back in time and sort of do a what if. What if we had been doing this procedure for the last six months? What sort of data would we have gathered? So we started collecting that data and you know, took the engineers off, offline a little bit and said, go pretend that you're doing this root cause analysis. You know, go do it for these last six months worth of data so that we have some place to start when we have these conversations. Then once we actually had this rolling, we started running into some different types of problems, right? So formalizing the handoff of, of the data became immediately important. So now we had all this data and immediately we had stakeholders lining up to ask for it. And we had to figure out all kinds of interesting questions about who's gonna consume this data and how. Uh, this is where it becomes really important to sort of understand your own organization and where information, how information flows through the organization, who influences whom to figure out if I give this data to the governance organization, are they going to make sure that it gets to the product teams in the right way? If I give it to the SDL team that we talked about earlier, um, are they gonna share it with the team that handles education on the SDL practices, or do we need to directly share it with that organization? Figuring all that out and coming up with good ways to formalize those handoffs is a, it's a continuing challenge to make sure that we, we properly navigate the organization. A good problem to have is everybody wants more. So once we started providing this data, people immediately started asking for more things. So our initial focus was on externally found issues that uh, arised from proprietary code and immediately people said, well, what about third-party components? What about issues that are found internally? And what about issues that are very interesting and deserve a deeper analysis? How are you gonna make sure that that happens? So right away, we had to start balancing expectations for how do you scale this operation up while we were still sort of getting it off the ground, formalizing the handoff, all the things that we just talked about. And a last example, which is a little amusing, uh, everybody wants, examples of root cause analysis. Um, and, and I ran into that even while putting this presentation together. So it's easy to sort of describe this process and then uh, sort of explain that this is something that's meant to, to show results over a large scale of data, but immediately someone says, well, give me an example of an issue that you did a root cause analysis on and what you learned. 
Uh, and sometimes it's hard to do that um, because the, the, the pitch here is really about giving you a large set of data about all the issues that you faced over the last three months, not about one specific issue that happened to be interesting. So uh, I apologize, this is not my favorite slide, uh, but it does get the point across about how we sort of decided to add root cause analysis into our PCERT workflow. So uh, anyone who's involved in PCERT sort of recognizes this overall workflow I've described at the top here, where you, you take the issue in, there's some triage and analysis, um, the engineering team, the product team does some remediation on the issue. Uh, you have to release and disclose. Uh, and then if there's some post remediation activities that have to take place. What we wanted to do here with root cause analysis was instead of adding a whole new procedure into our world, we wanted to sort of take some existing and some new stakeholders and sort of add some new actions into this process all along so that we could show value just by adding a little bit of incremental cost onto an existing workflow that was already pretty complicated. So during the triage analysis phase, for example, we ask our PCERT team to gather a little more information and provide a little more information, do some digging. What's the real world impact? What are the weakness details? Those things they were already getting, but now we're specifically asking to make sure that they have enough data to really feed the root cause analysis process. We also ask for a little bit of historical data. Do a little bit of research based on what you know from this product team. Have they run into this type of problem before? That might change how we think about the, the rest of the uh, root cause analysis. Once the problem has been triaged, once the development team is remediating it, there's a whole bunch of new things that might happen. We start pulling in and working more closely with our counterparts inside the SDL organization. We start asking them questions about their engagements with this team, what's happened in the past, how this team is complying with the SDL controls. They might have this information because they've worked with them as individuals. They might have it because they have automated tools that track these things. However they're doing it, they have some level of information that they're willing to share with us and we work with them to try and figure that out. We ask the development team earlier on how are you planning to fix this? Because that gives us a chance to provide feedback earlier. We try to dig a little bit into based on all the things we've just learned, what we think the technical root cause of the issue is and sort of confirm that with the dev team. What this gives us a chance to do is sort of provide some just in time education. We get a suggestion fix perhaps, we might offer that to the dev team, but we also might be able to provide some just in time education to others in, in there as well. Um, they may be saying, I plan to fix this by adding this filter or, or you know, doing this deny list. And we turn around and explain why it might be safer to use an allow list or to, to not rely on, on something or to build in some defense in depth, whatever the example happens to be. Based on all that, we then into the post remediation phase add a little more data gathering. So we pull the actual details of what the fix was. We're not talking about lines of code here, but what did you actually do? And then we make an assessment based on our expert knowledge of what we think this was supposed to do. And uh, that may give us some additional actions. It may be that the team did something that we didn't recommend, but they had their own business reasons for doing it. In which case we may need to open up new vulnerabilities. We may need to track things with the SDL team and explain that there are some changes that this team might need to make in the future because they made a decision that led to some residual risk. So I know uh, I mentioned examples as a problem earlier, uh, but I couldn't let this presentation go by without providing one example. So here's an example of the sort of work that we might do with a specific vulnerability. And this is a real, real world example. Um, there was a specific storage product that we uh, ran into uh, an issue that was disclosed to us by a researcher or a customer. I actually don't remember which one it was. Uh, that there was a, a port on that storage product that didn't require authentication. Um, and turns out it was, uh, it was meant to be on a management LAN and it was on a, on a front end LAN or something, something similar to that. And uh, that was reported to us externally and we had to fix that issue and then disclose it via CVE. Um, so as we talked about sort of, we have to bucketize that issue. What did we, what did we actually do wrong here and here as an effort to do that, we looked at the CWE. So we assigned it a common weakness enumeration, 668 exposure resource to the wrong sphere. 
And from that, we could look up in our mapping table and say, hey, this team, there was a design objective in our SDL standards that says you're supposed to be applying least privilege. And then there are some verification activities that we recommend you do, some tests that we recommend you run to verify that you have actually applied least privilege. And some of those things might be um, manual or external security testing. Uh, there might be some network scanning that you could do. Uh, threat modeling is almost always an example of something you could do to detect that sort of problem. So we wanna did that, assigned those you know, that's in an automated fashion. That just happens because once you know the CWE, you can apply those, those specific boxes. So then we worked with our SDL team and asked them to take a look at the artifacts of their prior engagements with this organization and found that there was a threat model produced for this storage product. But in this particular release, that port somehow didn't make it into the threat model and it didn't show up during the review of the threat model. And so looks like it was a manual error of some kind. So once we got the fix details provided and reviewed them and said, yep, that sounds like the right fix. It seemed like then at that point we could make our conclusion. So our root cause analysis conclusion, we take that issue and put it in one of those sort of what happened buckets we talked about at the beginning. And in the situation, the team basically did the right things, but there was a mistake made. So there was an activity that was supposed to detect this threat modeling. And there was a, an error made during the threat modeling exercise that led to this. So this, this was, a port that was missed. And then we made a recommendation back to the dev team and to the, the SDL organization that in the future with this team, you know, double check and make sure when you're doing a threat model review, make sure that there's a current network scan involved to make sure that nothing was missed. And maybe that recommendation would also apply to other organizations and other times that you're doing threat model reviews. So this is a bit of an eye chart, but uh, basically, trying to sort of explain here, now that we have all this data, who's consuming it and who are the different stakeholders that we involve and what data do they need from us and what value are we trying to add to the security posture of Dell by doing this root cause analysis. So whether it's you know the, the team that does the secure development lifecycle standards, whether it's the team that manages educating teams on our security practices, uh, we also have the governance organization that interacts directly with the product teams uh, at sort of a, uh, a senior stakeholder level and executive level to say, hey, these, these product teams aren't doing X, Y, or Z, uh, and you need to, to sort of apply that pressure. And of course, our own PCERT organization is a stakeholder as well. We want data out of this process uh, as, as well. We want to learn from it and get some value from it. So just going through some of the things that come out of it. Right, we, we know that there's some correlation to the different assessments that teams do uh, with our SDL process. We know that there might be novel vulnerabilities. Those are things the SDL team cares about quite a bit. Those are things that they would wanna learn from and we share that information with them on a regular basis. Our folks who are responsible for our education wanna know about gaps in our training. Uh, is there things that we should be teaching people about better or things that we're just not teaching them about at all? Uh, our product teams, our governance teams, and our peace suit organization, they care a lot about risk, right? So whether these are um, risks that were acknowledged in the past that materialized and turned into a vulnerability, that's an important piece of information for them. It might be meaningful to go back to an executive who previously signed off on a risk and explain to them this risk that you acknowledged in the past actually materialized, turned into a vulnerability, was reported to us by a researcher, was blogged about you know, in the security blog and, and gave us a black eye for a couple of weeks in the press. And you maybe could have prevented that by making a different decision. Now, maybe that executive made the right decision. Maybe uh, acknowledging that risk was the right chance to get that product out the door. And, and that's, you know, that's their decision to make. But I think there's some value to demonstrating what happened afterwards and giving them a chance to look back at it. Those same stakeholders obviously also care about new risks that are residual after making a fix. So if part of our root cause analysis determines that this fix that was implemented wasn't complete, we want to make sure that the right people are aware of that. Everybody follows this next piece of data, right? So we want to track what are the most common CWEs that we run into, the most common uh, weaknesses that we uh, we might see in the field. And uh, we make sure that we, we track that information of what we run into. 
from the SDL and education side also, we want to keep track of which SDL controls and which activities fell short. So in mass, this data gives our SDL team and our education team a lot of places to poke and prod and make fine-tune adjustments to what they're doing with our security education and with our secure development lifecycle standards. It gives them a chance to, to decide if there's some shifts that they want to make and in, in how we're focusing those activities. Meanwhile, along the same lines, our product teams and our piece sort organization probably care a lot about similar vulnerabilities that our analysis might find by product line. So if a particular product line, a particular group of related products and applications is running into the same problem repeatedly, that's something interesting that might drive a future conversation with that team. This uh, next item is something, again, everybody cares about, right? So we take all of the data that comes out of this process and pump it into a business intelligence application. And then we can present sort of live sliced and diced data across a variety of, of axes. So whether it's by date or by business unit, by criticality, by what type of reporter it was, by CWE, whatever it is, we can sort of present that data and, and do custom dashboards for different stakeholders. And everybody really is excited about the ability to sort of see that data and see it live, uh, being able to go into uh, business review with a product team and show them, you know, what's happened over the last six months with the, the vulnerabilities that have come in on the different products that they're responsible for. It's a pretty compelling story. And the last one is the one that I'm the most excited about is the ability to sort of provide just in time information based on the outcomes of these analyses. So uh, there's obviously in any group that, you know, the size of Dell, there's sort of a procedure for making sure how do we update our education? How do we update our secure development lifecycle standards? But there's also a chance to produce these, you know, bursts of information that are highly targeted and have to do with real world vulnerabilities that are coming in. And we always had this capability before, right? If, a, if an engineer came to us and said, hey, I noticed this problem came up three times in the last year, uh, it would be nice to, to educate people about it. But here it's more formalized. We can hopefully see these things by finding patterns in the data. And then we can look each quarter and say, maybe it's a good time for us to, to put together a short webinar about cross-site scripting because we're seeing it grow in these particular business units. Or maybe it's a good chance for us to put together a blog post about code signing and how important it is or about least privilege or whatever the, the problem that we're seeing crop up more frequently happens to be. So that is one of, uh, and, and the fact that that decision is not just based on one PCERT engineer catching something, but rather by the relationship between our PCERT organization and our SDL organization and the other stakeholders that we've talked about in this process, I think it adds a lot of value. So where are we and where are we going with this, with this process? As I mentioned, this process is something we've been maturing over the last couple of years. And uh, it's, it's really starting to, uh, to show some promise and people are really paying attention and interested in it. So we are maturing this process. As I mentioned, we're getting it incorporated into every aspect of our PCERT workflow. We're producing Sorry, these live. You yeah. Have a few minutes. You just have two, three okay. minutes. Okay. Yep. Right. Thank you very much. We're, we're putting together these dashboards that I talked about in our business intelligence tools. And we're really starting to evangelize that data and get it out to the different stakeholders who might care about it. And part of that process uh, is accepting feedback on, on the data and uh, learning from what different people need. Like I mentioned, in even some of our earliest conversations, we figured out that we were targeting some information that wasn't helpful to some business units and that we needed to sort of widen what we were looking for. So that leads to the next step, really sort of working with our stakeholders. We have regular reviews set up to make sure that we're talking with our SDL team, with our education folks, with the governance organization. We're making sure that the data is getting shared during regular business reviews. And then what's next? Well, we do know that we want to uh, do these sort of deep dives that I talked about. We wanna identify candidates for really interesting problems and do those deeper dives. So we've gotta figure out how to modify the process to enable that and make sure that happens. We wanna widen the net and figure out what sort of problems we might wanna try and attack that we're not looking at right now. And we wanna build up experts within our development teams who are capable of doing this sort of analysis on their own and driving it themselves so that we're not the only ones responsible for driving the process. So maybe we do this top level process and we help our dev teams sort of do those deeper level analyses 
and then work out some way to share the information back and forth because the, the data really has to be both within the dev team and within the security organization for us to really amplify its value throughout the whole company. So uh, last slide really quickly, what is the data telling us so far? There's not a lot here that should be surprising. Uh, this sort of information that we're seeing is stuff that the teams are already pretty aware of. We know that the critical issues that we're facing tend to come from application teams that don't have as formal engagements with our SDL procedures as some others do. We know that for teams that are already pretty mature and, and following all the right practices, they probably are at a point where they need to optimize that and do more security testing and more fuzz testing. We know that researchers are pretty good at finding issues that relate to authentication and authorization. Again, no big surprise there. Uh, the, the sorts of environments that researchers are attacking are slightly different than the ones that developers are testing in. And we have found a very small number of issues that have uh, some newly residual risk. So something new that was discovered during root cause analysis that we need to document going forward. Very small number, but they are there. So it's good to see. But I think the real message is, you know, ask us again in a year. We'll be maturing this process and hopefully I'll have a, a chance to speak again about this another time. Thank you very much. And I will be in the work adventure platform answering questions after the session. <laughs>